Just beyond the cluster of mailboxes was the Downey Farm, a rich farm, good flat bottom land, well tilled. John Downey raised hogs and corn. He had a windmill pump, acetylene gas lights, a telephone, an elegant house on a small hill. He had two daughters. We considered them stylish, sophisticated young ladies. He had a sturdy, fun-loving son, Chauncey, who returned to the farm to work after he finished school. He married, built another house close beside his father's, and gradually took on the farm management. The Downies were friendly, sociable people, always hospitable and interested when we asked to use their telephone in emergencies. Such as the time the orchardist fell out of a peach tree and split open his scalp, and Dr. Sandy came out and sewed it up with the hair from a horse's mane. The morning our sister Kathleen was about to be born, my father went to call the doctor from the Downey telephone, and one of the Downey girls was getting ready for her wedding that day. The Downey men were progressive farmers and made money from their land without off-the-farm income. They educated their children, went to church in town, lived well, had a good time, were kindly paid their taxes. The son who followed in his father's furrow did even better. The state never even considered offering to buy their land for the forest reserve. Now the town road itself was gone. The childhood farm we remembered was gone utterly. Nina and I sat in the car a few minutes looking thoughtfully at the place where the road had formerly gone down the hill. I thought of the story in my high school German book about the city of Germelshausen that sank beneath the sea and reappeared only one in every hundred years. A hundred years from now, who will own this land? It has known many owners, will have perhaps many more. For the land belongs to no man, however much he loves it. Probably the change was inevitable. Ours was not a repeatable pattern. Times have changed. People's ways of living and thinking have changed. As a public forest reserve, the land serves many people who need it. By the time Nina and I had driven back to the precinct, sunset was a great orange-red finality poised above the blue dusk. We hurried suddenly, feeling a great urgency to get away. We were not comforted. It would be a long time before we would know comfort after fulfilling the assignment ahead of us, but we were strengthened for it, and it seemed significant that in a time of acute distress, when we had to accept an unacceptable fact, it was to the land we turned for wisdom and strength, to the land we had known and loved in childhood, the land man's eternal kinsman. The Starling's Voice He ain't doing any good, Miss Blewett said in a harsh whisper. She was hard of hearing, and her voice was habitually loud, as it, as if she assumed all her listeners also were slightly deaf. With quick, bird-like steps, she crossed the room to where Dakin, long and bony, lay on the bed with his face turned to the wall. She bent over him briefly, peering with bright, dark eyes, then returned to her visitor. I can't tell whether he's really asleep or not. Delithe said, she said. Let's go down to the kitchen where we can talk. You can come back up before you leave if you want to. She led the way down the narrow stairway to Dakin's kitchen, where a fire was dying out in the cavernous smoke blackened fireplace. The kitchen had the smell of a room in which one man has lived alone for a long time. A table with, with leaves dropped under a worn oilcloth occupied one corner. A milk bucket and strainer were turned upside down on it. Near it was a cream separator, 
In another corner was an old kerosene stove encrusted with the accumulation of rust and grease splatters from years of use. Miss Blewett pulled two kitchen chairs forward and laid a stick of wood on the remnant of coals. Sit down, Delithy, she urged. I can't, I can't stay long either. I must go home and get supper. But I'm always jubilous about leaving Dakin here alone. I'll send John or Harold back with a bite for him. He don't eat much. Seems like he don't like anybody around doing for him either. The visitor nodded and sat down. The coals caught the dry bark and broke into a little blaze. It was early April when Dawkin first heard the starlings. He had gone up to his bedroom to mend harness because the ground was still too wet to plow. Spring was late that year. April was cold and rainy. Duncan had planned to break the southwest pasture that had been in sod since the spring of his mother's death eleven years earlier. He looked forward to it. Of all the farm work, the breaking of sod was most satisfying to him, and without realizing it, he had developed it into a kind of ritual. Rain delaying the fulfillment of the ritual frustrated him, and the boredom in the bedroom he pulled the harness stitcher close to the window and sat down on the narrow seat. It was an obsolete tool. Even his father had discarded it years earlier. It had a foot operated lever, something like the pedal of a bicycle by which a pair of wide wooden jaws above the seat were opened to hold strips of leather for stitching together. The stitching was handwork done with long needles and linen thread which Duncan waxed by pulling it across a lump of beeswax. Duncan used the harness stitcher because he never threw away anything. He kept it in the bedroom because the light was better there from a south window than in the kitchen, where there were only north windows. These two rooms formed a small wing to his brick, to his big brick house. There were eight other rooms in it, but Duncan seldom ever went into any of them. He broke off a length of thread, and as he drew it across the beeswax, he became aware of the low murmur of young starlings. The sound came from the attic just above his head, and it did not then sound particularly harsh, nor even unpleasant. Duncan remembered he had noticed a broken board just below the eave er earlier that spring. I reckon that's how she got into the attic, he said. In the bedroom was a rocking chair his mother had always liked, and near it an ugly square table with legs splayed out at sharp angles and clutching glass balls in their claw feet. A tall chest with varnish roughened and checked from too many winters in a cold room stood near the unused chimney. There was a flue hole in the chimney, but Duncan had never put up a stove in the room. He used this room for many uses. He had stretched a piece of heavy wire across one corner, and from the wire hung a few joints of smoke. Meat and some ears of sweet corn saved for seed and fastened together by the pulled back husks. In this chilly bedroom, Duncan mended harness he did not need and probably never would use on his one team of horses. By noon, when he went downstairs to prepare some dinner, he was glad to get away from the repet repetitious, harsh murmur of the young birds. In the kitchen, he lighted a tall smoked burner on the oil stove and set the tea kettle over it from a wide cupboard built into the wall Beside the fireplace, he took out a kettle 
of cooked vegetables left from supper of the evening before, and part of a loaf of bread still in his wrapper. Duncan used very few of the pans and spoons and housekeeping tools left by his mother in the deep cupboards. He scarcely knew, it, in fact, what was on their shelves. He had lived in that house all of his life. His grandfather had built it, making the bricks from clay dug out of the fields. It was stately and elegant, a two-story brick house. There were four square rooms downstairs, separated by a wide hall that ran the full length of the house, and four more rooms exactly like them upstairs. There had been a fireplace in each one, but Duncan's father, who liked comfort, had closed up some and set up stoves. All the cupboards and the mitered woodwork around doors and windows were made of yellow poplar cut on the farm. The rail of the long stairway that went in spacious leisure to the upstairs hall was made of walnut cut on the farm. Duncan was 46 years old. He had been a young man when his father died. He understood the farm work well, enough to go on with it. He and his mother had lived frugally from its small income. After her death, Duncan had withdrawn into the back wing, which contained only the kitchen and bedroom, and a sharp turned back stairway and small cellar. Now the main part of the house was given over to dust and spiders and an occasional mud dauber that came in and built a long celled house against the high ceilings. Wind rattled the loosening panes, rain ran down on the stone window ledges, and the house went on growing older. Duncan had few visitors and seldom visited his neighbors. Miss Blewett would have been a frequent visitor if he had let her. The Blewetts lived in a comfortable little farmhouse a quarter of a mile east along the road. They had modernized their kitchen with a pitcher, pump, and kitchen sink. They were progressive. They had a kerosene lamp that burned brilliantly with a long mantle and gave a light almost like a gas light. Miss Blewett ironed with a gasoline iron, and John Blewett was the first farmer in the community to buy a tractor. It had high steel tires with lugs, and he was not allowed to drive it on the road. Their boy, Harold, was in high school. Miss Blewett liked to talk and cook. Sometimes she brought Duncan a loaf of fresh bread or a bowl of donuts and left it on the kitchen table. She offered him news if she found him in the kitchen and sometimes invited him to supper. Duncan never gave her much news in return. The intimacy of discussing one neighbor with another embarrassed him. Besides, he didn't have much news. Miss Blewett, speaking loudly, gave him unsought advice. She told him he ought to rent the part of his house he did not use. Then, if anything was to happen to you, Duncan, there'd be somebody here to know it. <clears throat> now, as he sat at the table eating the warmed vegetables, he looked out of the window and saw how the green was a deepening stain across the fields. Buds were swelling in the neglected apple trees behind the house. There would be mushrooms there soon if the rain ever stopped and let the ground warm up good, he thought. Dawkins mother had always enjoyed gathering mushrooms. All that afternoon, rain seemed always on the verge of stopping and drawing back to let, to let the sun out, but never quite did and the starlings continued their murmurous sound. They're only birds, Dawkin told himself. It ought not put me out so much. In the evening, he went out and opened the barn doors to let the cattle come in. Their hair was wet against their sides, their horns shining with rain. Dawkin gave them some hay, milked two of them, and hung the bucket from a wooden 
peg in the feed room. The bucket was barely half filled. John Blewett had advised Dawkin to sell the six cows and put the money into hogs. What good is it, he reasoned, to milk just enough that you were to have cream to get rid of and not enough to have whole milk to sell? But Dawkin went ahead in his own way, separating the cream, keeping it cool in the cellar, and getting it into town about once every two weeks. Sometimes John Blewett hauled it in for him. He left the milk bucket hanging while he went to close the door of the sheep shed at the far end of the lot. The path to the sheep shed went past the loom room that had been a busy place when Dawkins' grandmother was mistress of the farm. The carding reel and spinning wheel she had used were there now dust covered. Dawkins' mother had never used them. She had helped Dawkins' father and Dawkins afterward at the smokehouse. There was a long wooden trough in the smokehouse for brine curing meat and a big iron kettle in which the rendered lard. In a small dark section of the smokehouse, the hams and shoulders and wide thin slabs of bacon had been suspended from hooks in the rafters and smoked slowly over fire that was never allowed to blaze. Dawkin still butchered a hog every year and smoked the meat there, but the butchering was done at the Blewett farm when John Blewett butchered. One man can hardly handle it alone. The sheep had gathered in the sheltered part of the shed. The spring lambs, frisky and strong-legged, leaped and played, and their voices sounded like children's voices. Dawkin drove them into a compartment that had a door he could close and fasten tightly. Angrily, John Blewett had sold his sheep because every year, once or twice, stray dogs got into the flock and killed and maimed some, and caused some of the ewes to lose their lambs. It was a dirty shame, he told Dawkin, because in that hilly country, sheep raising would have been more profitable than crop farming, except for the dogs. Dawkin kept only twelve ewes. He liked a small flock. They ate a good many kinds of weed cows wouldn't eat, and he liked seeing them docilely grazing in the fields or getting up in the morning after a hot day and going slowly out to the pasture. The rain dimmed late afternoon had sent the chickens to roost early. Dawkin went into the hen house and gathered the few eggs some of the hens in a fervor of spring plans had stolen out nest and were hiddenly sitting on the eggs they had laid in them. Dawkin put five fresh eggs into his jacket pocket, stopped at the barn to get the milk bucket, and returned to the house. Rain was still dripping like spent tears that cannot stop. When he went to bed, once when the starlings began their clamor above his bed, it bothered him. I'll have to learn to like it, or it'll drive me crazy, he admitted finally, but he could not learn to like it. It began softly, a sound shaken back and forth rapidly, increasing in loudness as it continued and always subsided after an almost intolerable length of time, but it always began again. Day after day that week, as Dawkin sat in his chilly bedroom, the voice of the young starlings became more difficult to endure. Once he went, he went downstairs and got the broom and used it to beat against the ceiling. Finally, a morning came when the rain had stopped, the sun came out, and the ground was dry enough to break. Dawkin curried the horses as if for a ceremony, harnessed them and went out to the field. As he drove in between the sod stone posts at the gateway, he heard John Blewett's tractor already plowing the field across the road. 
although he knew John Blewett would be done with his 150 acres before he could get 25 plowed with a team and walking plow. Dawkin was jubilant as he prepared to lay off the first land. He could not have expressed this exultation in words, nor explained why. With the plow point in place and the team waiting for his get-up, he had to pause, take a deep breath, and look across the thick greening sod of this field. This was his best field. It lays well, Dawkin thought, with, with satisfaction. Green and fertile, it was enclosed by a stone fence that followed the natural contour of the land. His grandfather had laid out the fields and hired expert stonemasons to fence them with flat stones brought in on ox carts from back on the farm. Their deep underground foundations made them secure against burrowing animals or frost heaving. The top of the fence was a line of stones laid on edge. The fences were old and weathered and solid, and the sight of them gave Dawkin deep pleasure. He looked down the long line of green sod into which his plow would soon cut, and noted the sunlight falling goldenly upon it. At the far edge, red bud seeped pinkly out of the soft greening woods. Dawkin knew that before he had this cornfield finished, the red bud would be fully open, paled to the pink of raspberry juice blended with cream on a dish of cobbler. Sassafras already was a golden haze on the green bushes, and in the big gray beech tree the bronze green sharp points tilted upward, ready to open into new leaves. A red-winged blackbird suddenly cried, Walkie, walkie, walkie. Dawkin had tied the lines together so he could have both hands free for the plow handles. Now he settled the loop of line around his neck and started the team. The plow cut into the moist green sod, folded it over in a shining brown line, leaving a clean brown trough. It's scouring good, said Dawkin with deep satisfaction. The fragrance of freshly turned earth was pleasant to him, and when he had reached the far end and looked back, he saw that it had attracted birds too. They were looking for earthworms turned over in the furrow. For a short time, Dawkin was supremely happy. But it was brief. The sun withdrew. The sky seemed to contract, and rain was certain. Stubbornly, Dawkin went on until the backs of the horses were wet. Then he took them to the barn, but left the harness on, as if by stubborn unwillingness to accept rain, he could stop it. When he went upstairs to get a piece of smoked meat to cook some dinner, the starlings set up a long, shattering cry, and suddenly Dawkin could not endure it any longer. He left the meat on the table and went to the barn for the long ladder, which he set up against the house wall, directly under the broken board by which the starling had gone into her nest in the attic. The ladder was too short, he could barely reach his hand into the opening. He got down and found a long stick with which to poke into the nest. It was not quite long enough. The starlings shrieked. The frightened mother bird flew out and passed close to his face. Dawkin ducked aside, throwing his weight to one side of the ladder. Under the uneven pressure, the ladder sank suddenly into the rain-softened ground and tilted out of balance. Dawkin clutched for the eave, missed it, and felt himself falling helplessly outward, plunging into pain and then darkness. When he awakened later, he was in bed in his own room. A lamp was burning on the square table, and Miss Blewett was sitting in the rocking chair. Seeing that he had opened his eyes, she came toward him, bringing a glass of water, and urging him in a harsh murmur, Rest, Dawkin, don't try to get up, rest. It was difficult to get out words, making, asking her whether it had 
stopped raining. She said the rain had stopped, and Dawkin attempted no further words. Time passed for him in a blend of pain and confusion. He seldom knew whether it was day or night. He did not know how long he had lain there. He swallowed what Miss Blewett brought him and told him to swallow. Sometimes she was there, sometimes John Blewett was there, and sometimes the boy Harold was there. Once in a while, when Dawkin opened his eyes and saw no one, he thought that perhaps he had died. He kept waiting with an acute dread for something he could not quite identify, until suddenly he realized it had been a long time since he had heard the starlings. You know, Delithy, he never was a hand to talk much, said Miss Blewett. She spoke loudly now that they were in the kitchen, and she did not feel required to whisper. It plumb surprised me how much he talked when he didn't know it, and what he said. He kept on going about some birds. They was a nest of young starlings in the attic. I heard I had Harold go up there and tear it out. She leaned back to look out through the window, then turned again to her visitor and he talked about that field that he was aiming to break this spring. Seems like it worried him terrible. She bent toward the visitor with a kind of odd, almost frightened bewilderment on her face. So as soon as John got his own cornfield broke, nice with the tractor, Dawkin had heard Miss Blewett coming up the stairway. Sunlight was pouring in through the south window, and he knew the rain was over. He raised himself up on one elbow to look through the window and see whether the field appeared dry enough to plow, but the pain that followed this small exertion brought him back to his shoulders again. At this moment, Miss Blewett stepped briskly into the room. Happy with good news, you don't need to fret any more about that field now, Dawkin. John's got his own corn ground broke now, and just as soon as he finishes his bite of dinner, he'll bring the tractor. Dawkin interrupted her with a cry that Harold Blewett heard even downstairs in the kitchen. Miss Blewett stepped back and screamed as Dawkin struggled out of bed, fighting his own protesting body, and reached the stairways where he collapsed in pain on the floor. Harold, running up the stairway, caught him before his head struck the floor. Together, Harold and Miss Blewett got Dawkin back upon the bed. I tell you, Delithy, continued Miss Blewett in the kitchen, I wish you could have seen the look on his face. It was like something back from the grave, the way he jumped out of that bed, and him so crippled up he hadn't even been able to hold a spoon and feed himself. He kept a screaming, no, no, and I thought we was hurting him, getting him back into bed, but come to find out it was the field he was talking about. He didn't want John to plow it with the tractor. I told him, I says, Dawkin, you'll never get that field broke, and it was, at, and it as late it is, with the horses. But he just kept hollering and moaning until John come in and promised he wouldn't touch it. Then he got quiet. He's been mighty quiet ever since. She was silent looking out of the window at the spring swept land. Do you want to go up and see him for a minute, Delithy? The visitor shook her head, no, and Miss Blewett went with her to the back door. Looks like it's really spring now, don't it? She said cheerfully, harshly, well, come back, Delithy. Upstairs, Dawkin lay still, his whole body ached, but he was grateful to Miss Blewett that she had not let him die. He felt a deep sense of sorrow, of loss, but also of peace. It was almost the way he had felt at the death of his father. Father. He knew now for a certainty that he could not break his field that spring, but also he knew no one else would break it. This was his portion of earth. He thought now of the clean, brown, yielding furrows the fragrance of freshly turned sod, thinking he surrendered himself to a profound peace, he was kindred of, of the earth 
and like it durable, he too could wait. Wide and starry sky. Walter Petten always said he had lived in Spencer longer than anybody else had. Always, that is, after he had become old enough to boast about his age and had begun singing his family letters, Grandpa at 90 plus. He lived to be 95 years old, and in his last years, when he had finally delegated the care of his Owen County Creek Bottom Farm to his third son, Mark, he spent much of his time reading, keeping farm records, and writing letters to the families of his sons, Tom and Dick, and to people whose public records particularly engaged his interest. He had always read extensively newspapers and histories, especially Civil War history, even in the busy days when he and his brother Howard drove a horse and buggy out to their partnership farm near Rattlesnake Creek every morning. In the later years, when they drove a partnership car, Walter still got up in time to build a fire in the coal-burning water heater in the kitchen, make coffee and eat breakfast and have an hour for reading before going to the farm. For although he was insatiably a farmer, and his father and grandfathers and great-grandfathers had been Owen County farmers, he did not live on his farm. He had lived in town from the time he was seven years old, when his father, growing wealthy and successful from farming, moved into the little county seat town. When Walter and Clara were married in 1903, they began housekeeping in the town and never moved to the farm. Grandpa Plus lived in a big white house on Washington Street. It had three living rooms connected by sliding doors and a wide hall with a stairway in it. There was a round window of imported red glass in the south wall above the stairway landing. When the sunlight came in through the window, it turned everything red that passed it, and whatever was already red, a woman's dress or somebody's lips, seemed to lose its redness. Clara niece had always wanted to live in that house, but it was not until after her fourth son was born that she attained it. She had grown up on a farm near Jordan village on which her widowed mother and two brothers made a comfortable living for six people. After she graduated from high school, she went to teacher's normal school one summer, and by the time she was 18 was teaching a country school. She had been teaching in the Spencer school system four years when she married Walter Pedden, choosing him from her several bows. That was before rural electricity, furnaces, power mowers, good roads, or the daily mail delivery came to the farms. Land and livestock were wealth, but town living was considered more elegant. Clara liked elegance. She liked things decorated, nothing really plain. Embroidered dresses, carved furniture, Havilland china with delicate floral patterns, dinner knives with mother-of-pearl handles, sterling silver forks heavily embossed. She was a pretty woman with shining light brown hair, too silken to hold a weave. She had a pink and white petal soft complexion, as all the Ness women did. She had a slim waist and full red lips that never needed lipstick. She liked to sing. She liked to talk about <clears throat> the beauty of farm sunsets and to admire good purebred cattle, and she enjoyed a drive to the country where, in autumn, she could gather bouquets of small lavender field asters from the roadsides or bring home wild grapes to make into dark jelly but she did not want to live on a farm. 
She liked being a part of town society, a wife of a wealthy farmer's son. She was interested in art and music, pretty clothes, a nice house, and the pleasant things of town living. At the time of her marriage to Pedden, to the Pedden brother, the Pedden brothers, and their father Thomas owned four large farms in Owen County, and most of the Beam Pedden Bank beside it. It was e easy for Clara to persuade herself that her farm managing husband needed to live in town so he could go downtown every day to get shaved at Stimson's barber shop where he kept his shaving mug with his name on it or to keep up with the livestock market or town affairs or whatever there was to keep up with and talk to traders who might want to buy or sell hogs, cattle, mules, or hay or townspeople who needed hay for their town kept driving horses it may have been hard for Walter to adapt his pattern of fiery, impatient haste to the tempo of a wife who genuinely preferred to be a few minutes late to church and was always 15 to 20 minutes late getting meals on the table and detested getting up early to get a farmer's breakfast or pack lunches to take to the farm and sometimes was in tears while she did it. But as long as he was free to devote the major part of his time to his farming, living in town suited him. All his life the farm came ahead of his other interest. He had a gift for remembering what he read and heard and for getting answers to what he asked and for quoting it in his conversations. By the time he was in his 80s, he had accumulated such a voluminous mental file of Owen County history and biography that reporters were calling him the county's philosopher historian and he was always a fertile source for a reporter who needed a nostalgic local history story. He was small, witty, wiry, perpetually restless and loved to talk. Even when he was eating, he liked talking better. He didn't care too much about what he ate, though he liked a piece of bread to eat with everything, even pie or candy. He liked sandwiches or sliced radish radishes between slices of buttered bread. He liked a special corn casserole I baked for him, but he liked talking so much more that some that I sometimes suspected he enjoyed mealtime chiefly because it was a way to get people together and keep them quiet while he talked. During the two depression years, when Dick and I lived on the Rattlesnake Creek farm, Walter and Howard brought their lunches from home and ate in the kitchen. By the warmth of the big coal-burning base burner, while I cooked dinner for Dick, who worked in town and came home later, Howard's wife packed him a careful lunch including a thermos bottle of hot coffee. The thermos bottle was his special pride, and he showed me its temperature-holding glass lining explaining it. One day, in particular, I watched the two men at dinner, Walter sitting cross-legged on the front, on the floor in front of the stove, eating buttered white bread and talking. He was enjoying himself so much, I secretly buttered a slice of bread and ate it to see if it could taste that good. It didn't, of course, but then I was not sitting on the floor, cross-legged and talking like a motor at a drag strip. Howard was sitting on a chair in the corner behind the stove, quietly enjoying his sandwiches and little dishes of applesauce and baked beans. He finished the last drop of coffee, replaced the thermos cork, and gave it a loving tap too firmly. The glass lining shattered, and Howard looked across the room at me, with an expression of positive bereavement on his face. Walter went right on talking. Walter's birthday was on May 25th, and traditionally Clara baked strawberry shortcake for him that day. Somebody usually gave him a box of cherry cocktails, his favorite candy. Clara was an excellent cook and enjoyed holiday dinners and family homecoming meals which she prepared in the inconvenient too-small kitchen 
of the big house and served in the dining room that looked out upon a side street. In this room she had three glass-doored cabinets, filled with pretty, fancy, and old dishes. By But by the time Walter had become Grandpa 90-plus, she was not able to do much cooking. They went to their son's houses for Christmas and Thanksgiving and birthday dinners. They had four sons, Richard, Paris, Mark, and Thomas Milton. As soon as the boys were old enough to know the farm and occasionally go there and to work on it in the summer, they wanted to move to it. But Walter and Clara never seriously considered moving to the farm. They hadn't even considered it earlier when the bank failed and Thomas Pedden sold all the farms and the livestock and living on the farm might have been thrifty. Rattlesnake Creek Farm, which Walter and Howard had bought back at that time, had a small, charming, two-story poplar house built in 1849. It had a fireplace and a hand-carved mantel in each of its five rooms. Colonial windows with small panes, wide, random-width boards on its floors and inside walls, but Clara had no desire to live in it. They lived instead in other houses with far less personality. One for a few hard years, was what Dick later described as a little shotgun house. You could stand in front in the front door and look right through all three of its rooms. It was so close to the tracks of the noisy cinder spouting train that no grass or flowers would grow in its yard, and the boys could not walk there barefooted. They lived in another house called the Goat House, because it was during that time the boys had a goat called Mabel and harness and a little wagon to hitch her to. They moved later to a small, quaint, and much-wanted house on Hillside Avenue. Their youngest son was born while they lived there, and from that house, despite the pleas of the older sons, they bought the Washington Street house and moved into it. The first of the Pettin family ever to live in the Rattlesnake Creek farmhouse was Richard. After he was married, we repaired the warped floor floors and broken stairway, replaced the broken window pane, panes, roofed the house, and put back the small portico, painted and papered the inside, opened up the fireplaces and repaired them, and built a cistern. But it was not a successful arrangement. After a couple of years, Dick transferred Howard's half of the farm to Walter, and we moved to a farm in, in another county. It seems strange that a man who said, I had to farm, It's in my blood would not have realized that farming was likely to be also in the blood of his sons and would not make a place for them on his farm, but Walter had reasons for never taking his sons into actual partnership. He always said the farm would not support another partner. He and Howard went through the difficult depression years and years of being always on the verge of financial emergency, as well as through good years. Howard kept the bank deposit book but Walter wrote the checks and kept the meticulous, detailed farm records. Actually, I think he could never bear to share the authority of his farm with anybody until he had to. He and Clara never discussed the farm problems or made farm decisions together, and that was probably, probably because the farm was a business, not their home. Creek Bottom Farmers did not use commercial fertilizer, they counted on the fertility washing down upon their fields from the hill farms. The, they discounted the burrs and weeds that washed down with it. The sandy loam fields of the Rattlesnake Creek Farm produced lavishly without commercial fertilizer, but there was always the menace of spring floods. The farm was threatened by floodwaters of White River, which also invaded the town and of Rattlesnake Creek, which was nearer, one year when Dick and I lived there, the flood came up into and around the lower barn, 
and stood there so long it filled the air with the odor of fish, even up to the house on its high sandy knoll. Several years later, one May, when we were living in a different county, Walter wrote me in quiet sorrow, We are having a flood here, more than a hundred acres of fine corn under four or five feet of water. It happened many times. The farm he loved was treacherous. Like a jealous woman, it could be beautiful, lavish, or cruel, but he never stopped loving it. 